So without further ado, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for this year. And I'm actually really, really psyched to have him here because um, he arrived yesterday and the first thing he did is he came down to our knock and started hacking the batch, which I personally think is freaking awesome. Uh, I think he has the most pimped out batch up to this point, apart from Jan, who has spent some time before the con, so really happy to have him. So he's the co-founder and chief scientist of Veracode. Uh, he used to work for Loft Heavy Industries, then AdStake, and later on Simon Tech. He's a member of Cult of the Dead Cow and its Ninja Strike Force, and most of you guys probably know him as one of the co-authors of Loft Crack and the author of the original code of Back over fifth two thousand. So, please give a huge round of applause to Christian Ryu. Great. Okay. So I'm actually not going to do an amazingly technical talk this time. I'm, the last talk that I gave was at Black Hat, and it was about uh, static binary analysis internals. It was like two hours of intensive basic block analysis type stuff and data flow analysis. Uh, um, this talk is actually gonna be about my experience uh, becoming management at a startup company. Um, this is not something I necessarily chose but found myself doing. Um, so the, the question um, for most of you guys is probably what happens um, when hackers become management. Um, you know, we have this image of what we will be able to do and what we can accomplish. Um, and many times that involves telling others what to do. We're not, we're naturally very independent. Um, so the question is, um, you know, what, uh, what choices do we make and what do we study and what do we learn in order to be more effective in that discipline? Um, I started off um, my life in Maine, uh, which is sort of a backwoods area of the US. Um, with really nothing else to do but system programming. Went to MIT, graduated in computer science, um, and worked at a small incubated startup for a little while. It gave me an idea of exactly all the wrong things to do at a startup. And basically, they were done in maybe six months, blew all their money, spent it on food, um, uh, and uh, ended up going back to, to MIT for uh, um, you know more ideas. Uh, I, at around that time, at the end of the year, um, I went to Loft Heavy Industries on a, on a whim and freaked my parents out. Yeah, like so, you're leaving this bank job you were doing, and you're going to work with a bunch of hairy hackers in a in a in a warehouse somewhere. Went over real well with the family, um, but I, I thought we were onto something. You know, I was asked to become like the first programmer that they were going to pay to do work there, which was kind of like a hacker space that was paying people to do stuff. It's like, oh wow, we could actually, if we actually make some money with some products, we could all leave our day jobs, you know, you know, which we had, you know, assumed handles so we wouldn't get fired from our day jobs. If we could just get rid of the day job, we could do this stuff full time. And that was really attractive, you know, so. Um, we ended up kind of fulfilling on that when we started at stake, uh, which was sort of one of the first pure play network and consulting, um, security consulting boutiques. Um, I think we at, at most had 150 people at AdStake before we found that we were just working everyone to death and they would leave. Um, I think maybe at that time, we, there were probably 500 qualified security professionals in the world that could have done that work with that kind of uh, uh, level of utilization. We were making people work 95%, and you only got to be home every once in a while. Um, I very begrudgingly took a contract at Microsoft to help out and a bunch of other stuff, and uh, you know that didn't work out amazingly well. But you know I got to do some interesting work. Like I was on the team that helped secure IIS uh, six and ASP.NET, which was pretty neat. Worked with Dave Itell and some of the other people, and got to know these people. Um, didn't realize how useful that would be until afterwards, when AtStake broke apart and basically formed all of these other little boutiques, like everyone seems to have like an ad staker floating around in, in, you know, that they know. Um, ad stake was acquired in 2004 by Symantec, um, at which point the work that I was doing was almost lost underneath the, 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 the rear end of a much larger corporation. And uh, we ended up spinning out Veracode um, in 2005. I could tell you stories about how we protected our IP and all of this. Um, 
So I'm going to skip over some of the stuff here, but uh, uh, I'm still writing Lovecraft, believe it or not, in my spare time. Uh, there was going to be a Lovecraft 7, and uh, you'll have an API with which you can plug into it. So, All right, so this is what I looked like um, when I started. Um, I was a programmer, had no publications, and my motivation was completely to just get a job and figure out what was going on. Um, plus five years in, I would have called myself a hacker. Um, uh, meant I had published a lot of advisories, a lot of tools. Um, my motivation was to get into the media as much as possible. I think that was sort of a CDC thing, still is. Um, I think that's pretty much our only goal at this point. Um, uh, 10 years in, I, was, I would call myself a security researcher. I was working on binary analysis software. And my motivation was really to do something that people were claiming was impossible, which was to reverse engineer binaries in a completely automated way and produce high-level source code. Um, that worked out pretty well, and I ended up here. It's like, whoop, start, burp, burp, right? Uh, same, same person, all the hair fell out. Maybe it had something to do with trying to do something impossible, but ended up um, the chief innovation officer of a small startup, um, which is now becoming a big business, and I'm really happy with the way Veracode's going. Um, right now, my publications are pretty much speaking engagements. I haven't had a whole lot of time to do anything other than code internally. Um, so all of these steps that I think, and I, my, my life basically reinvents itself every four years. Yours does probably too. You have some decisions, big decisions you think about, you make them. You may leave your job, you may get promoted, you may publish something that changes people's perspective of what you should be working on. Um, but basically the changes are not necessarily just due to time. It's not just that I'm getting older, it's because we made decisions along the way. So making good decisions is kind of key. Getting perspective of what has worked for others is really important. Um, but the question that I'm trying to answer here is how do we build a better hacker security professional? How do you get um, to be better at your work and be better at management in the end? Because it's an almost inevitable at some point that as you become more experienced, people will look to you to pass on that knowledge. And then at some point there's going to be a management moment for you. Um, so growth of the security industry, please ignore my useless charts. Um, the security industry itself is very important to understand um, because you're a part of it and it is moving very quickly. Um, I would still say that today there's probably about 500 qualified security professionals in the world and that's a linear growth or maybe there's maybe up to a couple thousand now. But there's many more pr practitioners that are that are coming in, and it's it is accelerating. Um, at the beginning, I'd say that security might have actually been the the second occupation ever. If you can guess what the first one is, you'll understand why I think security might have been the second. Um, uh, around the '60s to the '80s, we had um, sort of a period where people didn't really think about security at all. It was about getting computers to work at all. And in 1998, um, we had the Morris worm, which I believe the, we actually, it may be the, the 28th or something, or whatever it is, or 23rd, I don't know, I, my math sucks, but um, I, it, may, it may have been done today, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, anyway, um, so at that point, we, we, we got to a point where we realized that this was going to be more than just sort of a hobby for people, that there was actually a security aspect to computers. Um, you know, we had a, a decade of building firewalls. We had, you know, maybe four years of figuring out how to build good, con uh, good consultancies. Um, I'd say another five years of security architecture and, you know, inventing things like the SDLC and, you know, process for security and uh, putting process in place around something that had been more of an art form. And big data security and application security is sort of coming in as we've gotten really good at the network layer. We're kind of going up that stack. I don't know if we're ever going to be able to solve the social problem of security, um, but it is. Uh, it's on. We're, we're all well on our way to getting to the point where that's maybe the first point of entry these days, rather than just port scanning. So you see a lot of these uh, businesses that we're going to end up working for. Um, your experience may vary depending on what track you're taking here. Um, if you're in a consultancy, there are certain things you're going to be doing. If you're developing products, security is sometimes an afterthought, but more and more companies are, are putting it up front now just so that it can get it out of the way. Um, enterprises are uh, have numerous different models for incorporating security people into what they do. Um, most notably, you know, there's the security department, there's the security on the IT team itself. 
in security QA and engineering. Um, security is being used like pepper still. Um, we aren't quite, you know, we're putting it on everything and sprinkling it on, but we're not necessarily at the point yet where uh, security, I mean, CISOs, how long does a CISO right now maintain its job on average? Well, it used to be four years, now is it? Now I think it's two. You know, we fail fast in this industry. That is one thing we know. So, uh, you know, until those jobs start to have some retention to them and, they, and, and, you know, you can actually build careers that aren't dead ends like that, you know, you go become a CISO and it's like, oop, two years, you're done, you better have made your money. Um, you know, uh, if, if you're terminated as a CISO, it's going to be really hard to convince people that you knew what you were doing. So, you know, where's the career in that, right? Uh, software as a service, you know, we're basically, you know, Veracode right now in my company is like a subscription for everything. Um, you know, hopefully someday we'll be able to make a giant platform out of what we do. So, you know, what happens to companies over time? Sort of, there's a parallel between what happens to people over time. There's a seed, you know, you might get some money to start building ideas, and then you have a startup where you, you put together a bunch of people that you know and you're kind of judged not on the ideas but on the people themselves. And then a small company where you're judged mostly on your execution and your ability to make good on your promises. A growth period, hopefully. Uh, at this point, if you don't hit this growth period, it's because you've gone out of business. Um, but uh, the growth period is really about um, making good and executing. You know, you execute as much as you can try not to run out of cash, and then hopefully you reach some kind of maturity. If it's the end you planned for, congratulations. If it is not, well, there are many alternatives. Um, what is success? You know, what happens at the end? Um, you, 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 usually you come into this with an exit strategy. You come in thinking, hmm, you know, what, what do I really, how long do I want to be in this game? You know, I want to do security for five years, and then I want to, you know, uh, go live in a beach somewhere, or, you know, perhaps, you know, you know, one of those people that actually managed to do both. Um, but uh, rarely I find myself on, on the beach with sand in my toes, more, more so sitting at my desk trying to figure out, you know, another line of code for whatever project we're working on. Um, but basically there's a few models. You know, build quick, um, try to sell early, uh, long haul, try to build a large company. And then there's the lifestyle company, which is this um, void that a lot of companies end up in because they didn't really think about an exit strategy, so that, you know maybe they're you know 20 years out now, and they don't really have a plan. Uh, you're not growing anymore, um, but you're also not looking you know ripe for a future investment. Or uh, at that point, you have to do it only for the for the love of it, for the love of the art, or whatever. But you know your company's not going anywhere. Regardless, chances are, you know lifestyle companies, you end up transferring control when somebody dies in the end. I mean it. Piece, you know, ancient CEOs you will know, have been running a company for 30 years, and then they'll have to hand it off to a young buck that wants to become a CEO, that kind of thing. So plan for that. Success factors, a lot of people will talk about building shareholder value and um, having market leadership. Um, you know, all of, a lot of that comes in with uh, the idea of maybe if I'm doing something unique and build it, people will come. Um, but really, many times, it's about the small tactical things in your strategy and your timing. Um, stability and predictability is what you're going to be judged on uh, many times. Um, if you can say, I'm going to do a certain amount of sales in a quarter and then actually make good on that rather than missing or hitting. I mean, you never really hit the number for the quarter. You always blow past it or you come short a little bit. But if you know, that delta can be shrunk down to the point where you are actually a predictable entity, then you'll do really well in the market. People will say, oh yeah, yeah, no, we know what to expect from company X. Um, you know, you become a public company, that's all, that's all uh, that's gonna matter. So what is the success for a security professional? We are all motivated differently. You know, for me, the, you know, we actually use the lock picks at, at Veracode as part of our our interviewing process, put them out on the table and say, hey, can I get you a glass of water or something? If I come back and see you messing with the lock picks, I don't care if you picked it or not, we're gonna have a different conversation. You know, If you're not messing with it at all or you, you don't even ask me about it during the interview, then maybe, maybe you're not the kind of person that I wanna be working with. So what motivates you? You have to ask yourself, why are you doing this at all? Are you doing it for altruism? Because you think it's a good thing for the world to be working on security, money? You want 
to be able to do this for your job so you don't have to do something else. Do you want fame? I mean, I did at one point. I thought it was cool to you know, get up in front of cameras. Uh, are you bored? I was bored in Maine. That's kind of what got me started. Uh, many times we're you know, in it for ego as well because, hey, you know, I could do something that nobody else can do. And that drags people into a whole lot of interesting psychological stuff. You know, do you like your job? You have to ask yourself that, you know. Do you want to do security full time or are you doing it full time today? You know, where do you want to be in 15 years? And you know, I didn't really necessarily know, but I knew that I wanted to be the master of my own destiny and that, you know, I wanted to be able to control what projects I work on and have resources and I had to fight for that because generally you're doing somebody else's code, doing somebody else's work, somebody else's ideas. You know, I wanted to do my own ideas and I think that independence really drove me to making some of the choices that I've made. Now, some, uh, some, some cautions. Um, becoming famous sounds like a good idea, but once you're famous, it turns out that it's quite hard to turn that into money. Everyone wants something free all the time. Um, so, you know, once you do have some money, um, then you don't want anyone to know about it. So you try not to be famous, right? So it turns out that these two things are actually potentially, to be famous and rich, not easiest thing to do in the world. And you see it and you hear about it, and you see celebrities and all of that, it's much easier to be one or the other. But if you choose the path of going down the road of being famous for what you do, you'll either end up in jail or just not making any money doing it and spending all of your time with the media trying to explain what you're doing and all of that, but not necessarily making any money from it. Um, so what does success look like? Um, success is different for everybody, but we can all tend to agree that money is not equal to happiness. But money can be a, an enabler for future success, so it is a reasonable goal to add to the list of things. Maybe it should be third from the top. Um, I tend to think that happiness can bring about money um, because you need to love what you are doing if you're going to be successful at it. Um, your career requires that you love what you're doing. So what is good enough? Is there a perfect job? Um, is there a perfect role? Um, basically, I think perfect is the mortal enemy of good enough, and we will get to that, but um, you know, uh, we do make choices, so one of my choices had to be about school. Uh, I wanted to go to MIT ever since I was five years old and read Seymour Papert's book on Logo and move the turtle around the screen. Uh, I, I realized this was a place where stuff got made and was really entranced by that. Um, I read a lot of Marvin Minsky's AI stuff very early on and I ended up taking a class with him, which was blew my mind. But um, the question is how much school do you need? You know, I know more out of work PhDs um, with a relevant degree that simply have priced themselves out of entry market. You know, you come out of the school with a PhD and you know, an employer's gonna look at that and say, well, we gotta pay him a lot more and he doesn't have the real world experience that we need. So why don't we just go with somebody with a bachelor's degree? You know, so I looked at that and I was like, well, when I was graduating, it was 1998, the internet bubble was just getting started. And I was like, well, why don't we just not go for a master's degree and get out as quickly as possible? Truth is, I never liked school. Um, I hacked all the time rather than going to class. Um, I got C's and things I shouldn't have. And one day I was called in to my, uh, advisor at MIT and she said like you she, she told me she was one of the better cryptographers um, in, in the world and she told me that I had no future in computer science and that I should pick another degree um, I you know a little disheartened by that she you know I went back and I was like oh, I got to think about my life what am I doing you know should I be you know, going to class more and she went on sabbatical for a semester and I ended up taking a, a current trends in computer science uh, sort of a what's going on in the world class. Um, and one of the first assignments was to study uh, some publications about an Internet Explorer buffer overflow <laughs> that I had published under my own handle. The, the professor didn't realize that I was in the class and that they were feeding my own work back to me as coursework. So lucky for me, I didn't have to do homework because the homework was me. Um, I told the professor that and it blew my mind, but it also gave me the fortitude to continue with computer security because I realized that I was doing something relevant and new. Um, you know, so really you can't let people tell you whether or not your decisions are good ideas. You kind of go with your gut a little bit. Um, you know, that said, graduate. You know, chances are you're not Steve Jobs or Bill Gates. You know, and there are plenty of billionaires that have worked 
all the way through college and gotten their degrees. So, you know, you may need that backup someday. Specifically, if you're going to management, you might need business school. It's possible that if you're going down the executive track that you might want to learn those things. There's a lot about finance in there and knowing whether decisions are good ones based on their outcomes that you can learn something from. So one thing that I have brought to the management scene is the, uh, the notion of hacker culture as a management uh, advantage. You know, basically, hackers come into the workforce and they're, they're skeptical. We're all skeptical people. Basically, you have healthy skepticism, things like prove to me that you've done some work before securing, you know, securing that machine before we put it on the internet. You've got unhealthy skepticism, where basically we tear down all of our teammates, you know, finding all of their faults, you know. Everyone has faults, you know. <laughs> you know I mean, it's very easy to, to get to the point where we exploit our team uh, rather than support them. Um, paranoia is something that we develop because we realize that everyone is out to get us. Um, you know, we think healthy things, like we should conduct full security reviews of the software with each quarterly release and automated reviews with every minor release, that kind of thing. And unhealthy uh, paranoia comes out many times and like, you know, I think the sales and marketing team have it out for the engineering team. You know, they're, you know, they're counteracting our efforts and they want to put something up ugly and stupid up on the website that's going to make us look dumb, da 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 You know, that kind of thing is very natural for, you know, the hacker manager and the hacker and, uh, engineer um, to experience in the workplace. We have maker ethics, we want to build things, we're independent, um, and many times we spread that to other people, it's infectious. Um, and there's a lot of idea generation that comes from the brainstorming that we, that we do in, in the workplace. So, you know, in, in, the, in the real world, um, Google time is a good example of the hacker culture. We got 20% of employees' time being spent on non-work projects, with many of which, which end up you know, benefiting that company. Veracode is a, a company that does regular hackathons. We do three-day stints where you stop doing all your work for the company and go do whatever the hell you want, as long as it's uh, inventing something new or playing with a new, uh, new, learning a new thing, and then you have to talk about it in front of the whole company and explain what it was you did. Sometimes it's going to benefit the company. Sometimes it's going to be like learning to knit or something. You know, whatever it is, you have um, to explain it and show how you learned it um, and why you learned it. Um, there are security awareness trainings that are happening. People that never care about security are now participating in, in corporate events that actually teach them the basics of like, you know, how not to get fished and all that stuff. We're starting to attack that social problem. It, it is happening. Um, so, yeah, and, I was, and my, my statement here was that we, we tend to be condescending toward the teeming clueless masses. We should at least show them how to evolve, you know? So I was just kind of me joking, but... Um, management survival tips. Um, there are um, a few things that you can take away from this talk, rather than simply me bloviating in your face about management. Um, you have to think about role progression. Um, you know, you're going to start off as an individual contributor. Um, chances are, if you're good at what you do or you inspire people, you'll end up as a project lead. That tends to, you tend to graduate from that toward being middle management at some point, um, you know, managing teams of teams. Um, and you may end up in executive management, you know, thinking about the big picture of the company and things like that. You'll, at that point, you're going to end up dealing with CEOs and board members and people who have, um, you know, less of a connection to the actual work. Um, and simply know that they want to get their money back at some point. Um, the thing to watch out for is the Peter Principle. You know, who knows what the Peter Principle is? A few people. Okay, good. Yeah, it's, it's basically that people are going to be promoted to their level of incompetence. Um, so at some point, you have to ask yourself, you know, do I want to take the next step, or am I you know, hopeless, hopelessly uh, uh, overconfident about what I'm going to be able to do? Um, you know, I know plenty of good engineers that have simply said, I want to be middle management, and I don't want to be anything more than that. You know, I want to continue to have my fingers in what people are doing, you know, writing code, but I never want to become an executive, because then I might be too far away from, from the action. Um, so we're going to go into the Ten Commandments of Hacker Management. I have ten things that are absolutely important, I feel, that have, you know, helped me succeed here. Um, well, we'll see if I succeed. We've got a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of time left here. But um, uh, number one, thou shalt appear presentable, approachable, and kind. Um, all of those are different and important. Appearance does matter. Um, you know, I've at times 
you know, eschewed the notion of, of, of showering and cl being clean and all of that. Um, the, it, 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 the, the normals don't like it very much. Um, so, you know, if you're going to, to manage, uh, it's best that you at least make an effort to appear presentable. Um, kindness is important. It will be rewarded um, if you can find it somewhere. That's good. Uh, thou shalt be a good team leader and a good individual contributor. It's tempting when once one becomes management to use that as an excuse not to do any individual contributions. You know, just basically telling everybody else what to do. If you delegate absolutely everything, you're not doing your job. Because, you know, effectively, when you manage, you're on a team as well as managing a team. You know, the team you're on um, is really important. Um, the team better be the better than the sum of their parts. Otherwise, you are completely irrelevant in this process. You know, if you are not making the team better than a bunch of individuals, then you're not doing anything useful in the management capacity. Thou shalt prioritize the team you are on rather than the team you lead. Now, that might be a little um, counterintuitive, but basically, when you're a manager, the buck stops with you for everything beneath you and for your individual contributions. If you're going to be passing something up, you need to be passing up your individual contributions before you pass up your team's contributions. You can always delegate management to the team itself or to the strongest members of the team if absolutely necessary. But if you fail in your own personal capacity ever, then the team you're on will reject you and you will no longer be allowed to manage. You know, so management is sort of a privilege as long as you don't stop being valuable in an individual capacity. So don't forget that. Number four, thou shalt be inclusive of many skill sets and expertise in your organization. We tend to gravitate toward hiring A players all the time. You know, we want to be surrounded by the geniuses and intelligentsia. This is, while valuable, um, no way to run a business. You need C players and B players around you too. Um, otherwise, all those smart people will never want to do the boring work. You know, try to build a research organization without some young people and you'll find that all of the really intro level boring stuff never ever gets done and you know, people will see that group as valueless. So, you know, hire a wide spectrum of people and wide spectrum of skill sets. Expect to, to, to do knowledge transfer internally. Promote internally. Number five, thou shalt embrace time management techniques. We love to take on impossible projects that take an infinite amount of time. You know, we, when nobody is, is, is looking at our hacks, we, it doesn't matter how long it takes to finish them. Um, in, in the working world, you have requirements about when you're going to get something done and you're going to make commitments and people are going to make decisions based on your commitments. You know, sales team's going to go sell the thing whether it's done being built or not. So you better not, uh, you better not um, make, you know, bite off more than you can chew, bite off more than you can chew in a reasonable time frame. Um, you're not invincible, and keeping your team all together with tools will keep your schedules realistic. Number six, you shall not depend on rock stars and hero coders. Um, I almost titled this talk and went down this this one slide um, completely. I was gonna, uh, I was considering uh, a few titles here. One was uh, the death of the security rock star. It is important to note that security knowledge is valuable, but that a single individual may or may not be a good team member or valuable, and they may, you know, personality problems can, you know, cause us to wonder why we hired somebody who's so smart and just can't seem to, to, to make the team better. Um, the quote that there are graveyards full of indispensable men plays in here. You know, so consider what it would mean to put all of your resources behind like, you know, a few geniuses and then not have, um, you know, a, a mechanism by which uh, you, you could swap them out at any one time. Hero coders that take on giant projects are not, uh, are not going to be um, scalable. People don't scale. You know, you can't just ask them to do more work than their 40 hours. It's just not going to happen. Or rather, if they do, it's going to be for short bursts and you can't rely on it. Um, thou shalt embrace process. You know, all of these crazy things like Agile and Scrum and all that other shit, get with Kanban. Learn with some tools. Um, get religion around process. The best decision that I ever made at Veracode was to make sure that we abstracted each department and gave them a single point of entry for communications. Basically, you have one place 
for sales to come to engineering and ask questions like, can we support this or not? Um, you have one place for engineering to say, where should I send sales leads? You know, uh, you know, you have these kinds of internal questions. And the question is, how do you, um, uh, you know, make it easy? Uh, and once a company gets to be above 200 people, it's like, who do you talk to? You know, you need these sort of role-based email addresses or ticketing system or whatever in order to deal with it as things grow. So consider single point of entry for communications. It's like an abstraction barrier. Make sure you don't silo everything off. You know, you don't want an abstraction barrier with no way to get in. You don't need an ivory tower that's impenetrable, but you need clear and defined interfaces between different parts of your company. Number eight, thou shalt not require perfection for it is the mortal enemy of good enough. I've said that before, but raising the bar is what our industry is about. You will never win. You will never catch the bad guy. If you do, it's almost useless. You know, I, I have been to so many government working group kind of things where they, everybody sits around, it's like Alcoholics Anonymous for people who have been hacked in the government. You know, oh yeah, I was hacked uh, six months ago, here's how it happened, blah, 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 blah. But the underlying reason why they're there still isn't, I, they haven't gotten to the point where they say, oh, I've got a problem, you know? They're still saying, I wanna get the bad guy. You know, they're still blaming somebody else for security. So internally, you know, uh, you can't expect perfection from anything. You know, you have to find a line that's good enough and, and be okay with good enough. Um, recognize good enough when you see it and, and, and your projects. Um, ship on time, you know, ship. Real developers ship, I think is the quote. Number nine, thou shalt trust but verify. Um, we tend in security to become micromanagers. You know, people who will slice and dice a project up into tiny little pieces and then crawl up people's butts on a daily basis to make sure they're doing their work. Um, that really is discouraging, you know, every day having, you know, the manager, so what you get done yesterday? Okay, what are you gonna do today? Okay, you know, um, that kind of thing um, discourages the, the natural creativity that needs to happen in order for people to enjoy their work. Um, so uh, review people's work, but let them do their job, damn it. That's sort of uh, really important. Number nine, uh, number 10, uh, thou shalt give feedback well and take feedback even better. Just about all of management is giving feedback. Um, you know, beware the shit sandwich. Anyone heard that term? There's a bread, the shit in the middle, and another piece of bread. Somebody comes in, this is, this, this is like the number one management technique. If you, don't, you want to skip all of business school, learn the shit sandwich, right? You sit down, pull somebody into your office, and you want to tell them bad news. So what you do is you compliment them first. You say, oh, uh, you know, I'm really impressed with your progress on this project, but we need to talk about blah, 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 shit, right? And then afterwards, you're like, but you're really coming along, and I, th you know, I think in six months we should do another review, and I, I, I really trust that you're going to be, you know, this, this issue will be resolved. And then they go, you know. After like two or three times of that, you start to recognize the shit sandwich when you see it. Okay? Management, there's more to it than the shit sandwich. So, to, you know, um, you know, recognize that giving feedback, you, you want to be direct. Um, we're not, rare, rarely do we have any problem with being direct, but be kind too. No one's going to take feedback if it's not presented in a way that doesn't feel threatening. Um, you know, so know your stuff. You know, hackers and the people that you've hired, because chances are you're going to hire people like yourself to a certain extent. Hackers don't like criticism from people that don't know their stuff. You know, I, I find it way easier to go to an engineer and talk and say, we need to rewrite this code because, you know, nobody can read it. And he'll take it from me, but he won't take it from some other engineer uh, that maybe doesn't know, you know, uh, somebody on his team, you know, doesn't want to be judged, that kind of thing. Those personalities, I mean, egos are, are hard. You got to be careful with those. So, you know, it's important to know your stuff. You can't lose touch with the thing that got you to where you are, you know, you got to keep studying. You got to keep on top of your game. Otherwise, no one's going to respect your 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 judgment calls. So know your stuff and know how to give feedback and be a good hacker manager. Um, you know, uh, I think I think that's basically it for my slides. Um, I got two minutes left, so you know, if there's any questions, I guess I could take them. But uh, you can always find me at the bar here. Um, and uh, a plea, a plea. I'll just make a plea. Let's get back to something technical real quick. Someone in this room needs to write a really good SSDP spoofer before they leave. 
It's the easiest protocol in the world, completely unauthenticated. You can make Windows boxes think that printers, networks, faxes, whole other computers, file systems appear and disappear at will on the network. It's like UPnP, but on crack and crazy. So uh, there is no really good SSDP spoofer that I know of. I, I would love to have one. So if anyone wants to write it, that'd be great. All right, cheers, guys. Enjoy hash days.